Well, welcome back uh, to our concluding uh, plenary address and uh, panel presentations on this uh, very stimulating morning. I thought I might just set up the, uh, before I introduce uh, Sheikh Hamza a little more formally, but in not great detail, would just make a few observations about something, a question that sometimes comes up. And the question goes like this. Some would argue that it's odd, even inappropriate, for non-Muslims to be involved in the debate about religious freedom in the Muslim world, the Muslim majority world. At the uh, Religious Freedom Institute, we have a proposition that's central to our work which says there are very specific roles for Muslims and non-Muslims to play in this discussion. And it's the same thing we say when we're in Myanmar or China or wherever it is, that the dialogue always has to include both the majority populations and the minority populations. And this is the reason why. If you take the Middle East, uh, the non-Muslim minorities there, uh, it's not sort of an academic debate. It's a sort of an existential threat, you might say. You look at the percentage of Christians in the Middle East, say 100, 150 years ago, when it was something like 13, 14%. You look at the percentage today, um, you know, just a few percentage points, it's, it's a matter sort of, of survival in a place where they've, in some cases, lived 2,000 years or more. The same would be true uh, for minorities in other settings. So it's kind of uh, a question of survival. But there's a second reason. And the second reason is that sometimes the history of the non-Muslim minorities in a particular setting can be of use. I think we saw and heard a little of that in uh, Dr. Philpott's uh, presentation because the sort of the humility of the minority to recognize that their own traditions uh, are not error-free are often problematic, is a very good exercise in humility. And also to acknowledge that we needed, most religions need to develop and to think about their current situation in a, in a critical and reflective way. And then I would add a third reason for the involvement or the unique contributions of non-Muslim minorities in this case to the discussion, and that is if they are honest and they do a serious study and analysis of the majority uh, religion, and they're honest about it, what they have to say about it could be very useful. We started out today with the proposition that there's a culture debate going on with respect to Islam in the West in which there are a number of people who are fearful, whether they say so or not, that there's something with Islam in Islam, in the DNA that is problematic. In that culture debate, if there are non-Muslims who come to the defense of Muslims to say, wait, wait a minute, study the history more carefully, study the sacred texts more critically, look more critically at this, and, and they say, hold on here, take a look, and remind their own traditions of their own past, it can play a major result. Uh, a major role in a positive direction. But at the end of the day, everybody understands that there's no question that the case for the full citizenship and pluralism and religious freedom has to be made first and foremost by Muslims, not by non-Muslims. There has to be a sense that it is fully consistent with the sacred text and the religion. It has to be understood as something which is positive towards the health of Islam. And that's why it's such a great privilege to have the opportunity to introduce to you our, our final plenary speaker today, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. And I've only picked a very few points to make about his background. Many of you know him very well. And as was stated before, you can read a bit more in, in the bio. But Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is clearly one of the Muslim world's foremost scholars on this topic. And what's interesting about Sheikh Hamza is that he is deeply steeped in the tradition of the Western liberal arts. I spent some time last night reading about his teacher, 
uh, when you were in your 20s and his emphasis, you talked about him uh, during the consultation, his emphasis on the liberal arts. He understands that world well. He understands the world of Islam well as well after 40 years of studying with leading scholars throughout the world. He's the president, actually co-founder uh, and president of the of Zaituna College in Berkeley. Uh, he uh, serves as the vice president for the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies in Abu Dhabi. But uh, this, of course, was founded by Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah, uh, who has been a major mentor to, to Sheikh Hamza. He's a prodigious reader. His knowledge is far-reaching. And what he has to say in terms of his scholarships and his YouTube videos is wonderful. I won't list the books, but I'll tell you one of my favorites. A wonderful devotional book is The Purification of the Heart. It's the kind of thing which makes you still believe that academics can reflect the piety that's the best part of our religions. The 2018 edition of the Muslim 500 uh, ranks uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf as one of the foremost authorities on Islam outside the Muslim world. Uh, finally, Sheikh Hamza is a wonderful friend, a devoted father and husband. We're glad to have his wife Liana, Liliana here and a member of the Board of Advisors of the Religious Freedom Institute, co-chair of the consultation, Sheikh Hamza. God, most merciful, the most compassionate. Prayers and peace be upon our Prophet Sallallahu and upon all the Prophets. Uh, first of all, it's it's wonderful to be at this campus. I we were so struck by just the physical beauty of the place. And so, for any students that are here, I know this is a Christian college. I hope that you really show some gratitude every morning for the blessing of, of being at a place like this and afforded the leisure time to think about things that are important and among them what we're talking about today which is uh, religious liberty. The Everything that I wanted to say has pretty much already been said. I think Daniel did a really good job so I'm, I'm tempted after two days of really exhausting conversation <laughs> To just open it up to some discussion, and but I'll, I'll say a, a, uh, some remarks. I did prepare a paper, uh, but I'm not going to read from it. I'm, I'm not a good reader from papers generally, um, but in, in the paper, what struck me at, at looking at this issue was, and and I do, I have a practice with the Quran, but. I was once asked to write a paper on death in the Quran, which was very interesting because that's one of the reasons why I converted to Islam, uh, my experience with uh, near-death experience and then reading the Quran. But I was asked to write a paper on that, which I, I did not think would be that hard. You, know, you, you look in a concordance at mot in Arabic, and then you look at all the verses that have mot in it. But what I found in writing that paper, which took, took me several months, and was published, a truncated version of it was published in the study Quran. It's an appendix in the study Quran. What I found in, in that, in writing that paper is that the entire Quran felt like a death meditation to me. And, and I really, it's, since I've been reading it since that time of doing that paper, it completely strikes me as a death meditation. You cannot find one page of the Quran that does not remind you of death. And the, the, the chapters that Muslims are encouraged to read every day are pure death meditations. Yasin, uh, Waqia, and Mulk. If you actually read those, you will see that the theme of those three chapters is about death. And not in a morbid sense, but in a sense of the gift of life is a tenuous gift. And being alive to the fact that you could be removed from the world at any instant is a very profound spiritual practice because it's carpe diem, as the Romans used to say. It gives you a real sense of making life important. One of the things that strikes me about uh, traditional photographs, photographs begin in the 1830s, but you will never see before the 20th century anybody smiling in a picture. 
And it wasn't because they had bad teeth. The reason I'm convinced that they did not smile is because they had some sense. First of all, it took a long time. They had to sit there, and, and the, uh, the, the camera's shutter speed was much slower than they are today. But um, I really am convinced, because the Native Americans, if you've ever read, cur seen Curtis's photographs of the Native Americans, you see the same phenomenon. You see the same phenomenon in the Muslim world. Why is that? Like everywhere around the world, they have the same. And if you look at the statues and portraits throughout human history, they never smile. The Mona Lisa has a very slight, I mean, there's a question, is it a smile or not? But I'm convinced that they really understood that something is going to be frozen in time and I want to be remembered as a serious person. And that is not to say that humor is not important, but humor is the salt of life. It's the spice of life. It's not the main meal. And I think religion, if anything, it reminds us of the importance of life, that this is a momentous thing, that we are here. Each one of us is a unique human being that has never existed before, that has an incredible genetic coding that is entirely unique. No other human being in human history has ever had the coding that you have. And you have a certain set of life experiences that no individual has ever had. And so you have this short time. Each of us has been given this short time on Earth. It's in relation to the overall time, it's an incredibly short time. So what do we do while we're here? For the, the, the ancient people, what was most important was seeking the truth, this idea of seeking the truth and understanding. And these were the great philosophers of human history. And, and, and they tried to convey that to people. But in many cultures, people fall asleep. They go into a type of group think and they don't want to wake up, and they really are bothered by gadflies. In fact, very often they kill gadflies um, because they, they wake them from their sleep, and sleep is very comfortable. To go on to automatic pilot, the default setting of the human being, it's just a very comfortable thing to do. And so the alarm clock is something a lot of people smash when it goes off, right, and put it on snooze. And this is the, the human condition, and so, you, then you have another element, which is the complexity of living together. And the first great difficulty in that is the family. I once read a book by Fazlur al-Rahman that said that he, it was called The Themes of the Quran. And there wasn't any chapter on family. And I said, that can't be possible. <laughs> like for a book that's sent to uh, the world as a revelation to teach them how to be, it, it must have family as a theme. So I, I decided to read the Quran just from that perspective, and I realized there is a chapter entirely dedicated to the theme of the family, it's chapter 12. In fact, it's the only cohesive chapter in the entire Quran as, as, in traditional linear terms. And it's about a dysfunctional family <laughs> of prophets. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of realized that I mean, they wanted to, the brothers wanted to kill Joseph, and they ended up throwing him down a well. And, and at the end of the story, Joseph forgives his family. And so what I realized was is that that is what family is for. It's to learn how to forgive because of the difficulties of just being born into a family that is going to cause uh, Great joy at times, but also great grief. And so we're a human family. And just like you have the uncle that nobody wants over on the holidays, right? Because they just know it's going to be a problem. But he comes. It's like Robert Frost said, home is the place that when you go there, they have to let you in, right? And in, in a way, our religious family has those uncles that other people kind of look askance at, but were Benny Adam, were the, were the children of Adam were, and Eve. She was there too. Um, we are the children of, our, uh, of these two parents. And even though we have this incredible diversity of color, of, of, of race, of language, of, of just physical features, just amazing bouquet of extraordinary divine artistry, if I could use that word. Some Muslim theologians would get a little upset with that. But So my point is, 
this diversity of religions is part of the human diversity, just like you have a diverse family. Um, if you've ever seen a, a litter of kittens, there's nothing more different than a, a litter of kittens. One of them's like clinging to the mother, another one's suckling, won't let go, another one's like fighting one of them. Somebody's trying to get out of the box. And, and, and this is the diversity that we find even in the most basic uh, animals uh, in the world. And so religious diversity is clearly part of the divine intention. And one of the aspects of a lot of cultures is this demand for homogeneity, this demand that everybody conform and everybody be similar, uh, everybody look alike and talk alike. And it's just, it's not possible. And so this desire to be free, this desire to be free is a profound human desire. People do not want to be, they do not know, most people love chocolate, but if you try to shove it down their throats, they're just not going to respond uh, in, in some kind of affectionate way. They're going to resist it. And, and this is why in the Islamic tradition, it's very clear that if you read the Quran, you will see this constant theme, had we wanted, we would have made you all similar. Had we wanted, we would have made you all believe. Had we wanted, uh, we would have made you one nation. There's several verses. And then there's all these verses where it says, for instance, Noah says to his people, can I compel you to believe something? Can I compel you to believe this and you don't like it? Right? In other words, I can't do that. The, the 1099 in, in Yunus, the, 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 the verse that says, Do you think you can compel people to believe? And right before that, it says, had God wanted, he would have made you all of the same religion. If you look at the verse in the Quran, la ikraha fiddin, there's no coercion in the religion for people that know some Arabic grammar, that is, is, is nefil al-jins. It negates the genus of coercion, which means all forms of coercion. It negates the genus of coercion. The very hallmark of a civilized society is that we choose persuasion over violence. That is the hallmark. If violence is the default setting of a place, it is not a civilized place. But we're a violent species. And this is a big problem. And there's ways that this was dealt with in the past. One of the ways in the Japanese tradition, the Bushido tradition, was to actually take that martial spirit and refine it. This was called futuwa in the Arabic tradition. It was called uh, knight errantry in the Christian tradition of taking this sense you know, this, 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 this uh, intense masculinity, what they now call toxic masculinity, which it very often can become, and refining into something virtuous, something noble, something that elevates people, where you defend children, you defend women, and people can say, we don't want your defense. Well, the Yazidi women did want your defense because when things break down, it's the women and the children that suffer more than any other group. And this occurs in wars. It occurs whenever violence strikes. Women do very well in highly civilized societies. But when it breaks down, something very different happens. So this is, this is the way that civilizations tried to do this, was to try to, to create a spirit in the individual. Now, the other thing that we have, which is a tragic aspect of our nature, is this group think, where we fall into the, the Tutsis and the Hutsus, and where, where I see the other. Now, if, if, if anybody knows about the Nika riots, does anybody know about the Nika riots? Right? The Nika riots were riots in Constantinople at the beginning of the sixth century under Justinian I. In the Roman uh, tradition, right, they had these things called the demes. These were sports teams, and they had colors. So they had these chariot races, and 
they initially had four colors, but then the chariots got, were reduced down to two, the blues and the greens. Not only did the, the, the chariot racers wear the color, all the fans in the stadium wore the color of their team. We're talking sixth century, right? The Nika riots occurred because the blues and the greens got into a fight. People were killed. Justinian had them arrested. They were punished to death. Two of them escaped. They fled to a Christian church as refuge. They were surrounded, and they wanted protection. The people there did not want them killed, the, the, their, the people on the same team. And so Justinian decided to just give them a prison term. But what he did was he decided to have some chariot races to calm everybody down. At the chariot races, instead of crying blue and green, they started shouting Nika, victory. This led to riots. Over 30,000 people were killed. These are one of the major calamities in sports history. Over 30,000 people were killed. Now, there's political reasons for why they were in their state. The high taxes, they were fed up with Justinian I. He was also a blue and, and, and sided with the blue side. So the greens weren't happy with that. Very stupid for a political ruler to take sides in sports because you lose a lot of people, right? The basket of deplorables, not a wise remark. <laughs> Keep them all as much as possible uh, on your side. So we also have hooliganism, right? Football hooliganism. People, I, I once saw a billboard in, Lon in London that said, if your religion is football, worship with Channel 4. <laughs> now, you can think that that's funny, but for some people in England and other places, religion and football are one and the same. Their team, that, that sports character, Beckham at the time, was the savior, right? Whoever it is now, you know, Salah, they chant in, where is it, Liverpool, you know? If he's a Muslim, we're Muslims. They'll even convert to Islam because if he keeps scoring goals, right? So, so we, we look at sports violence and as an educated person that used to be, I, I played sports in high school, I, I, on moments of profound weakness, I will look to see how the San Francisco Giants are doing. Um, when football, when baseball season is going on. But an educated person finds it really difficult to understand why there would be violence over a sports game. And that's exactly it, an educated person. But an uneducated person does not have that luxury because that is such an important aspect of their lives. It gives their lives meaning. They cover their walls in their room with their sports heroes. They know the stats. I learned statistics from my love of baseball in, in early, uh, as a child. That's one of the benefits of baseball cards is you actually start understanding statistics. So I did very well in, in my stats class. So religion becomes like a sport. You're on a team. And the uneducated people very often begin to treat the other team, instead of being gentlemen about this thing and gentle women which is really the goal of a civilized society, is to, to make gentle the way of the world. This is what Achilles said, that the, the great Greek desire was to tame the bestial nature of man and make gentle the way of the world. Uh, what the Arabs call adib, right? The adib, which is very similar to the idea of a gentleman and a gentlewoman. And, 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 and this is something that you will still see in people that maintain a type of understanding of, of just recognizing the right of others. The great Persian poet Hafiz said, if you realize that you were welcomed to a banquet by God, you were invited by God, but then that every single person that you see is also a guest to that same banquet, Hafiz says, how would you treat them, the guests of God? knowing that every human being is here with an invitation from their creator, if you're a believer in a creator God. 
that's something that needs spiritual cultivation and it should begin at the earliest stages. And it's something that unfortunately in many cultures we lack that cultivation. And so we begin to see the other, whether it's uh, racially or whether it's uh, gender, uh, for whatever reasons, we see them as other. I, 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 I find it one of the great uh, um, coincidences of language is that in the English language, we have other in brother, but in Arabic, you have brother in other. So in Arabic, to say other is akhar, but to say brother is akh. So the brother is embedded in other. And I think that's a better way to see it, to see the brother in other, as opposed to seeing the other in brother. And, and I think that's what we need to get to. Now, about the Muslim world, the Muslim world is, is a very complicated place, and even a monolithic statement like the Muslim world, I think, is really not very useful uh, because it doesn't really mean a lot. A place like Guinea or a place like uh, Mauritania is as different uh, as Indonesia, uh, as Ireland is to Albania or something. They're really different places with different cultures. In Saudi Arabia, women wear a very dark, it's black. Um, I saw a very funny cartoon where it showed, uh, you know, a high school picture and they were all the women were in black and there are two women looking at it both in black. You couldn't see any face and she just says, mashallah, you haven't changed since high school. Slow reaction there for some. It's okay. Yeah, we're all. It's it's early, right? <laughs> um, but in in West Africa, they very, wear very colorful clothes. Like the women wear very colorful clothes, and they like those clothes. So that's culture. That's not religion. There's nothing in the religion that says a woman has to wear a black bag over her. The same in Afghanistan. That the the. The, what they wear there. That's culture. It's not religion. There's nothing in the religion that says that. And yet, somebody from that religion, from that cultural region, will equate culture with religion. And so when they go to West Africa, they'll say, why are those women dressed like that? That's haram, or that's not correct. I'll give you one example of this. I was in Mecca. I went in Mecca, and I had my 10-year-old my son was there, whose name is Daniel, Daniel. And there were two women there, I won't say from which country, but they asked him what his name was, and he says, Daniel. And one of them said, Audu Billah, that's not a Muslim name. <laughs> it's like, we're in Mecca. And <laughs> he, he came to me crying. <laughs> and, in, and that's true. In Saudi Arabia, they do not name their children Daniel. And in Lebanon, the, the Christians use that word. But in India and Malaysia, Muslims use that name. And Daniel is in the Book of Prophets, of Ibn Kathir. There's a chapter called Babu Daniel. So there's an example where because somebody didn't know something, right? So this is a big problem of just human <clears throat> ignorance. And it's interesting that embedded in the word ignorance is ignore, right? That, that it is without knowledge, gnosis, gno is the, is, is the Greek root of that, you know, to, to know. And the Quran says, we created you in these diverse peoples and clans to have gnosis of one another, to come to know one another. And then it says, the most dignified amongst you are the most dutiful, conscientious, and pious. People that are actually concerned about the human condition, that have compassion. My and, and I'll just conclude with this. My, my, my sincere belief is that government power deracinates, uproots, excises the spiritual power of a faith. And this has happened constantly throughout history. When a state takes over a religion, the religion is waning in its spiritual power. Our prophet said that the prophetic model would only last for 30 years in governance. And to the date of the end of Hassan bin Ali, to six months of his reign, it was over. 
And he said after that, he said, in Al-Quran wa Sultan Sayyaf Tariqan. Power and the Quran are going to go separate ways. So go with the Quran and don't go with the Sultan. Our scholars historically were very wary of being co-opted by state power. They were very wary of it. It doesn't mean that they didn't engage the state. They did. But they recognized the danger of religion being co-opted by the state. They recognized that. And this is why the devotional side of Islam, to me, is being so harmed by political Islamism. And it is an ideology. And I truly believe this. I really believe this. And I think a lot of the problems currently in the Muslim world are a direct result of this obsession with political power and this desire to get into power. Because once people get into power, they do what everybody else does when they get into power. If they're in a democratic uh, country, um, like, uh, well, I can't think of any right now. But if they're in, <laughs> if, if, if they're in a country where the rulers change every four years or six years, it's basically usually four years of these guys and then they say, these guys are rotten, let's get some new people. They bring the, the other group, the blues and the greens, right? <laughs> so then they bring the blues in and they're terrible and so then the greens come back. And it kind of oscillates over time like this, right? And this is what happens because I run a very small liberal arts college and it's really difficult. To run a state is impossible. I truly believe that it's a proof of the existence of God that states function as well as they do, right? With all their horrors and all their terrors. I really believe that there's just a divine element. It's the same reason I believe that children survive the first two years by purely angelic protection, <laughs> right? Because there's no way it's humanly possible. And I, and I had a real problem with my statistics teacher because I kept saying that it's unreasonable that accidents are as few as they actually are, given all the possibilities for accidents. He says, well, statistics just models what happens. I said, I know, but my point is you have to see that like people are driving around sleepwalking. They're changing the channel. They're on their cell phones. And we get to our, our destinations most of the time. <laughs> so. There's a miraculous thing happening on this planet, and it's extraordinary, and we have to relish it, and we have to also relish civil society wherever it is. I'm gonna conclude with just to think about these verses, and I, I find them very compelling. Uh, and, and I think the prophet said towards the latter days, he said everything will be confused. And, and he said that, that the world will be in a great state of confusion. And he said, even the most sagacious people will become confused by the state of the world. And so uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, said to him, what should we do in those days? He said, go back to the Quran. Let's go back to the Quran. And the guidance of the Quran about religious diversity is very clear to me. It's just very clear. And it's not, I'm not a Qurani. I, I believe in, in the Hadith tradition. Uh, very committed to it. But I think the compelling argument in the Quran for religious freedom is quite extraordinary. And, and this has largely been the practice of Muslims in most places. We have, I think, the apostasy laws uh, to apply the, the, uh, the apostasy laws that have been uh, in place for centuries in many parts of the Muslim world uh, would lead to a, a, a real exodus from Islam. I think it would, it would harm the religion greatly. Um, I come from an Usuri tradition, uh, which text and context always is taken into consideration. And human beings now, we, we are in a new world, and we have, to, we have to embrace it, we have to accept it, we have to understand it. Uh, we can't nostalgically look back in a past where uh, everybody believed simply because they were part of that culture. We are going to increasingly have people wanting to forge their own paths. And, and that's a very difficult thing. But we're in California. I mean, we, we know what that means. It, there, there, it, it, it creates uh, a very strange culture where everybody's uh, very, very different from everybody else. And there's something very comforting about being in a society 
where people are ethnically uh, similar, linguistically similar, and religiously similar. But that is not the world we're living in anymore. It's a very different world, and we have to accept differences and embrace them. And so I think the strongest verse in the entire Quran is la ikraha fid din. It negates the genus of coercion. There's no coercion in the religion. And then in, in, uh, in the verse in 548, minhaja. For each of you, we have given you a, a, a way, a shara, a sacred law, a sacred uh, set of rituals, and a way to be in the world. And then it says that had God wanted, he would have made you all one group. But this is a test. So vie with one another in virtue. Don't kill one another because you're different. Vie with one another in virtue. By their fruits, you shall know them. Be the best that you can be. You are the best community that came out for humanity, not for yourselves, for humanity. And, and as, as somebody whose uh, descendants uh, suffered the Irish famine, during the Irish famine, the Ottomans sent wheat to the Irish when they heard that there were Irish suffering. That wasn't for PR. That was because that was part of their religion. The same happened when there was a great uh, famine in France. The Algerians had bumper crops that year. This was before the French invasion of Algeria, and they sent wheat as aid. Now the US government sends aid because that's where the power is. But when you have power, that's what you should be doing. And when you're powerless, you have to understand that there is also a way of being powerless. And in some ways, being powerless, I think Socrates is absolutely correct when he said it's better, if you had to be one or the other, it's better to be oppressed than be an oppressor. Thank you. I could ask the other panelists to come forward. I'm just going to make uh, two observations about uh, what Hamza said. The first one is I was really struck, Sheikh Hamza, uh, by your comment near the end that the problem of the relationship between religion and the state or religion and power is absolutely central. But it's not just central to Islam, it is the issue that bedevils nearly every religious group. It's the one that for 2,000 years, uh, Christians have struggled the most with as well. When you read the history of Christianity, the big theme is how Christians came to have a very different sense of what their relationship should power ought to be. And it changed over time. So it is the sort of the elephant in the room is to figure out what to do about that. The second thing that comes to mind after that remarkable presentation is I know that uh, Sheikh Hamza's, one of his favorite writers is an English writer by the name of G.K. Chesterton. And G.K. Chesterton was a, a novelist who wrote Father uh, Brown novels and he wrote a lot of apologetics and he wrote a lot of uh, social commentary, very prolific, brilliant genius. When he died in 1936, I don't remember which newspaper it was in, but there was an obituary of, uh, about G.K. Chesterton in which one of his editors said about G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton had the capacity to take any topic that he touched and hang all heaven and eternity on it, or something <clears throat> like that. That reminds me of what we just uh, witnessed uh, with Sheikh Hamza. We get used to talking in abstractions and arguments, etc. But we don't talk about beauty or literature uh, we don't make our um, truths uh, reflected through all the many aspects of civilization. And it is, uh, it's, a, it's a truly wonderful thing uh, to behold. So we have three respondents. And since you've got the bios, I'm going to be very brief because once you, the three of you have spoken, I'm going to ask that you perhaps speak for six or eight minutes each. And then if, if uh, Sheikh Hamza would like to respond or add anything, he may. But I'd like to give an opportunity 
if I can, for some of you in the audience to make comments or raise questions, and we need to stop by about 12. So just a few words about our three uh, fine um, respondents or panelists first. Mustafa Akyol is a Turkish journalist, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, often you'll see his writings in the New York Times and other publications. He's written a remarkable book called Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, um, a book that has uh, been banned in certain parts of the world, uh, but it's a very important book. Dr. Sherman Jackson is the King Faisal Chair in, uh, holds the King Faisal Chair in Islamic Thought and Culture, Professor of Religion and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. I might just mention that his research interests include classical Islamic studies. He's writing a major book right now on uh, tentatively titled Beyond Good and Evil, Sharia and the Challenge of the Islamic Scholar. And our third um, panelist is Dr. Kutab Mustafa Sano, who is a minister, a minister in the office of the president and diplomatic advisor to the president of Guinea. He has a remarkable career. In fact, between 2011 and 16, he was the Minister of International Cooperation for that country. And 2009 to 11, he was the Minister of Religious Affairs. And he, in addition to these ministerial appointments, he's a scholar and a published scholar. A published scholar. He's a scholar in his own right, a teacher, professor, and a scholar who publishes as well. So I think what we will begin with is uh, Mustafa, if I could ask you to go first, and then Dr. Jackson, and then Dr. Sano. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of God, the compassion of the merciful. Thank you so much, uh, and thanks for hosting us at Pepperdine. It's been a great experience. Uh, we had two amazing days of conversation. We even survived the mountain lions that we were warned about. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you for being with us uh, for, uh, for the audience as well. Now, uh, I, I of course totally agree with Sheikh Hamza in the basic idea of freedom that we find in the Quran that is strongly you know, emphasized in the, in the core source of Islam. But of course, not every Muslim agrees with that. And I think that's a conversation about which we have in the Muslim world today. I actually you know, experienced that personally. About two years ago in Malaysia, I gave a lecture in very similar lines on the issue of apostasy. And I mean, I emphasize like Rafidin, no compulsion on religion and apostasy issues should be reinterpreted. It was contextual and it had a more political sense now. And at the end I said, well, religion is not something you can police. Uh, it's a matter of the heart. It's not something to be policed. Well, at the end of the speech, five men came in and I, they said, are you Mustafa Akio? And I said, yes. And they said, well, we are the religion police. <laughs> And so I had to spend the night with those gentlemen, and luckily they let me go the next day, but they said, don't come back and speak about these issues in Malaysia again without tevliya or permission from the government. And they you know, banned the book as well, because they think that uh, apostasy is a criminal act, and uh, they're not as harsh as the you know, Saudi or Iranians probably, which would decree that penalty. But you know they believe in correctional facilities or you know rehabilitation centers uh, to convince the apostates. Um, now this is a conversation we Muslims should have, and we, we should always remind ourselves that if we were having a conversation about freedom and religion four centuries ago, it would be very different. We would be asking why these Christians don't get that they should not burn heretics and. You know, they should not force Jews to become Christians. And why don't they get the more enlightened and tolerant ways of the Ottomans, right? People, people were asking these questions. I mean, some of the Protestant leaders, some Enlightenment thinkers actually refer to the Ottoman Empire at the time as a better example. Mm -hmm. um, but things have changed dramatically. On the one hand, in the West, with a nicer part of the Enlightenment, uh, and then with the change in Catholicism, the idea of freedom in all levels, you know, advance and religious freedom advance. And we have this idea of today that people should be able to free and you know, came the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the meantime, 
The Islamic world even didn't keep its pre-modern toleration. It got worse in many levels, if you ask me. And that had different reasons. The Muslim world became less secure, insecurity bred intolerance and conspiracy theories towards minorities. Uh, certain interpretations of Islam, which were very much on the margins in the pre-modern era, uh, the most inflexible interpretations of Islamic jurisprudence became very popular and powerful thanks to a modern blessing called oil money. And uh, the Muslim world lost some of its tolerance, whereas you know, the, the Western world uh, became more tolerant notwithstanding all other problems in modernity, like colonialism and so on and so forth. That's not a problem, but we are speaking about human rights here today. Now, to go forward, we need a reinterpretation, I think, of certain elements of traditional jurisprudence that we have today. And that, you know, our scholars here already emphasize that needs, you know, going back to questioning issues about abrogation and so on and so forth. I would also remind that as a Turk, the Ottoman Empire, interestingly, solved a lot of these issues in the 19th century, and many people forgot that. The Ottomans, uh, first of all, rendered the laws about apostasy obsolete by, in the 1840s in the Tanzimat reforms. That's why it became possible in late Ottoman Empire to openly be an atheist. Some were, some, some, there were some people like that in Ottoman Empire, materialists. They were not killed or punished for apostasy. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, also Jews and Christians were given equal status under the law, which is another part of the discussion, very important. Jews and Christians in the late Ottoman Empire became equal. That's why they entered Ottoman bureaucracy. The Ottoman parliament convened in 1876, uh, had a big chunk of Jewish, uh, Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Armenian uh, deputies. So they became, started to become statesmen uh, as well. And this happened under the Sunni Caliphate. So we should remind ourselves that th these things happen. Now, the Ottomans did not do much ijtihad on these issues, but they brought secular, let's say, state law to you know, change things, and the Ottoman scholars allowed the, the state's authority to uh, change issues in these, uh, in these matters. But today, maybe we need to go more forward, and I do think that we should, uh, one thing, there's one thing <coughs> we should understand. In terms of going forward, I think there are two different approaches here. One is what, what I would call the more neo-traditional approach with saying that within our tradition there are already solutions to this problem and we just have to emphasize some of those. I very much respect and I see much ground there. There's another more radical reinterpretation school that is called modernists in general. I find myself a little bit closer to that. Uh, but I, and I think the basic idea is that the core of Islam is eternal and unchangeable and it's divine. But that core was interpreted and articulated in different contexts than ours today. In, that was a context in which equality of all humans, that idea didn't exist. E gender equality didn't exist. That was a context in which slavery existed and was accepted as normal. Let's not forget that Islam encouraged freeing slaves, but did not abolish slavery as an institution until the 19th century. So, if we were able to change some of our jurisprudence on that issue, which we did, we can change our, I think, some of our issues uh, regarding jurisprudence on other issues as well, including gender issues or uh, freedom of religion issues. And one more thing, um, to move forward with religious freedom uh, in the Muslim world, we need another freedom that is also very important, and that is freedom of speech. Because unless we can discuss these issues, we can't have any progress. Unless it is banned to have a lecture like this. I mean, it's not banned, sorry. Uh, unless you can't have a lecture like this in all parts of the Muslim world, uh, you, can't, you can't go forward. And I think uh, we are at a time that Christians were thought their theology, Catholics were thought their theology, every tradition has gone through this. I think we are at that time. One mistake would be to think that these are just Western ideas that are coming to corrupt us. There are some Western things that might be corrupting us, that's <laughs> different, but uh, I think ideas of human rights and freedom are, are universal ideas which are rooted in our very sacred source in the Quran and in the tradition. We just have to cultivate them more. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, again, uh, I uh, want to join everybody else in uh, thanking uh, Pepperdine University and uh, RFI and all of those who are responsible for affording us this opportunity to come together and to discuss uh, an issue that I think is of, uh, of extreme importance. Um, uh, and I think it's of an importance that has a permanency um, that uh, we can all recognize. My remarks are going to be a combination of response to uh, Sheikh Hamza's remarks and uh, also the topic in general. I think that the one thing that Sheikh Hamza mentioned uh, with a, a degree of, of prominence was the issue of power. And I think that um, power is a problem uh, for religion. But I think that power as a problem must be treated as a problem. And as a problem, that means it is something for which we have to find a solution. It is not something from which we can necessarily flee. Prob power is a reality in the world. And while it may corrupt, uh, as I mentioned uh, during our consultations, I think that powerlessness can also corrupt. And so the challenge for religious communities becomes how, what are the mechanisms through which, what are the resources through which, we can moralize power, we can domesticate power, we can get power to do what it's supposed to do and prevent power from doing what it's not supposed to do. Uh, I don't think, however, um, that especially given the geopolitics, not only of the modern world, uh, but as the world uh, of the world uh, as we've always known it, um, that we can simply flee from the problem, uh, from the problem of power. And I think that it's even more important when we think of power in the context of the value of religious freedom. Um, one has to ask oneself how much religious freedom, <coughs> globally speaking, um, is, is likely to remain in a context where religious communities are completely and utterly powerless. Um, this takes me to the, the, the question of religious freedom. Um, this is, as I said, a, an, an extraordinarily uh, important topic, um, but I, 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 and, and not simply in what Sheikh Hamza said, uh, what Mustafa just said, and, and some of the conversations that have been taking place all along, um, I, I, I want to sort of problematize the whole notion of religious freedom um, by, by, by pointing out that it is important that we pay uh, ample attention uh, to both constituents of this phrase. In other words, uh, it is religious freedom. And I think that oftentimes, perhaps given where we are as children of the Enlightenment, the, the focus may tend to be on freedom. And we can insist that freedom be absolute and pure, even if that comes potentially at the expense of the integrity of religion. And I think that our real challenge here is to find the balance between the integrity of religion on the one hand and freedom on the other. And what I mean by that is that if we overly invoke a sort of a, 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 a particular mode of liberal freedom where individual choice, regardless of the substance of that choice, is recognized as being sacred, we then have to ask ourselves, well, how much integrity will religion maintain if that becomes the norm? And, and we can potentially end up in a situation whereby in the name of religious freedom, because we haven't given the religion side the attention that it deserves, we may actually end up with less religion, less religious freedom uh, rather than more. Um, um, the other thing that I want to uh, uh, speak to is, 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 is the fact that when we talk about religious freedom, and I'm thinking here particularly in the context of, uh, uh, of the Muslim world, um, religious freedom as a construct um, runs uh, the risk uh, of uh, being discredited if, in the context of the Muslim world, it is, it, it, is, it, is, it is pursued in a manner that sees religious freedom as being important for the minority, but not for the majority. In other words, we can focus on the kinds of deprivations that minorities suffer in a particular context and ignore the deprivations of, of the majority. Um, this is bound uh, to breed a certain amount of resentment uh, toward the very concept of religious freedom. And so I think we have to be very, uh, very careful 
uh, about uh, uh, talking about religious freedom, pursuing religious freedom, um, even defining religious freedom in a way that is insufficiently attentive uh, to uh, the plight, as it were, of, of the majority as well as the minority. And this takes me to uh, one other point that I want to make. Um, um, I, I am not at all, not even a little tiny bit, uh, insensitive or unalive to the importance of religious freedom for religious minorities, especially given the fact that I happen to be a religious minority in my own society. So I'm very aware of the importance of, uh, of, of, of religious freedom for religious minorities. I'm not trying to downplay uh, that significance. But if we want the construct itself to be able to do the kind of work that we want it to do, I think we have to be very careful about running the risk of it being seen as just another chapter in the ongoing saga of the post-colonial project of domination. Uh, and I'm just speaking frankly here because I think the situation calls for that. Um, um, but I think that there's an, a, another dimension to this. And I think that, I mean, this applies to me as, as a religious minority, uh, as well as to religious minorities in the Muslim world. Um, and maybe I'll pose this in the form of a question. Um, religious freedom as a right do we need to begin to think about the kinds of responsibilities that go along with that right? Um, 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 where I am in the context, let's say, of America, for example, um, what responsibility, does the right to religious freedom give me the right to conduct myself in very anti-societal ways in the name of religious freedom, right? Um, and, 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 and I think the same should apply uh, when we think about religious freedom in the Muslim world. And so when we're talking about members of society enjoying religious freedom, is that religious freedom seen as coming at the expense of whatever common commitments we have to the common good or society, or does religious freedom function as a basis upon which we can opt out of those obligations to society at large? I think this is a very uh, an important point because ultimately, again, if religious freedom is taken as an excuse for opting out, it will ultimately, uh, well, the situation will ultimately, ultimately become one where minorities suffer because the whole concept of religious freedom um, gets a bad gets a bad name. Um, I'm looking at my stopwatch. I'm doing all, I'm doing okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had two more points. I don't know. It's, it's uh, a miracle. A, make, see there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Make your point. Um, um, okay. Uh, the, the, the two last points that I want to make is, again, looking at the importance of maintaining not only the integrity of freedom, but the integrity of religion. I think that when religious communities come together to, 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 to negotiate this issue, we have to recognize that we cannot sustain the integrity of religion. And Sheikh Hamza did mention the, the concept of diversity. Diversity of religion itself implies that each religion has its own identity, <coughs> which itself implies a category of exclusion. In other words, I'm a Muslim, that means there is such a thing as non-Muslims. If I'm a Christian, that means there is such a thing as non-Christians. And I think that sometimes in um, I, I think it's a matter of just being overwhelmed by the situation. I think we take the sort of lazy way out and we think that by banishing all categories of exclusion, we all come together as one and that's our religious freedom. I think that's a very dangerous approach and I think that we have to be very careful uh, because that again, it breeds the resentment, especially on the part of my uh, 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 majorities. And if we take this sort of in racial terms, you can, we can see about something we can see something about what's, what's happened in America over the last number of years, where majorities become resentful of the manner in which minorities are enjoying, or, what, or perceived to be so, uh, certain uh, uh, privileges, uh, et cetera. So I think that um, um, allowing religious communities to sustain their identity as religious communities, and learning as people who are interested and committed to religious freedom, learning how to engage those uh, categories of exclusion 
without seeing them as categories of oppression or as means to oppression. I think this is really, really important. And then um, 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 the, the, the last point that I, that I want to make is um, I think that given the enormity of this issue, um, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would invite us uh, to think transgenerationally, um, to think in terms of not whether we can come up with the silver bullet right now, but in terms of whether we can lay some foundations that may empower subsequent generations to finally find that formula that enables us to do what we need to do. I think that, that, that overly rash solutions may be worse than no solutions at all. Because I think that um, they can end up uh, being a medicine that's actually worse than the disease. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not unalive to the urgency of, of the matter. But I think in, 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 in terms of getting it right, um, um, we, we, we need to be a bit more patient uh, in taking all of, uh, of the challenges that uh, 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 define the problem uh, and, and try to come up with something that actually gives us the possibility uh, of coming into uh, a, a, a new kind of world order for which this is the norm. Thank you. Dr. Sano. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much. Let me take it as an opportunity to, to thank uh, RI5 for inviting me to take part of this. And I'm quite happy to be in this uh, campus. Uh, originally uh, speaking before we get into politics, uh, I'm an academic. I think my presence over here is uh, to show some of these differences. For instance, academic is get into politics and what the academy could do for politics to make politics more moralized, as uh, Sheikh Hamza did in his speech. I would like also to thank uh, Sheikh Hamza. I think he has done almost the job <coughs> that we to be talking about this pluralism equal citizenship and religious freedom. Uh, before that one, I, I would like to appreciate a lot the speech of uh, Dr. Daniel. Dr. Daniel has uh, laid down for us what we could take it today as a basic for whatever we want to do for this religious freedom. Why I'm saying that's one, he has spoken about the seven seats. And these seven seats are known to be the one who should begin to summarize for all of us today what we're talking about pluralism. We are as thinking that uh, three, these three items, we have problems in the Muslim countries. Pluralism, which is a problem, is not something which is most welcome in many Muslim places. Not only vis-a-vis -vis the, this other religion, but even within the Muslim sects, the schools of thought, you are having the problem with the Shia and Sunnah, you have the problem with uh, uh, Salafi, and you're having the problem with others. So pluralism itself, and it's let it narrow down, it is a problem. When you come to other religions, it becomes a bigger problem at certain things. Second thing is about the equal citizenship. That is also another problem because for the minority who have been persecuted some other places. And then Finally, this religious freedom, as uh, my dear friend Mustafa did say, would we allow this kind of discourse, would we allow this kind of discussions to take place in many places in the Muslim world? Academia will have to take this the responsibility. They will have to face the realities that we are going through. Our reality today is that we have taken aside and we have put, in, we have put behind us most of the things, the seats that Dr. Daniels uh, stated in his speech. First of all, the discourse has been taken for the extremists. These three things, to them, they have seen to be dangerous. They look at them as something which is going to put a, an end to their emergence, at the end of their uh, whatever they do in the community. What we needed to do here, when you talk about it, it is not to be apologetic. I don't like to be, but I want to be critical. Why I want to be critical? For Muslims, we have been taught, Sheikh Hamza Hadid say, when you go and you get astray, what do you do? You get back where you are coming from. If I get into this campus, I don't know where to go. So I have to go to the starting point where I started. When you get to that starting point, you will find the things clear and much better. 
That is the issue for the Muslims. Are we really today telling that most of those people have taken the weapons, they have been going against communities, they have been persecuting the, the minorities, they have been going against even their own society, they have, gone, they have gone straight. So what is needed, that's the one Daniel mentioned it here. They will take all the things, the religion itself has been hijacked. The religion which is looking at the, at the, the blood, at the humanity, as if the same family, but in that family, you have differences. And the differences is the basic, it is the principle what Islam wanted it to be. Because Allah, God, if he wanted us to be all, why he created us into man, male and female. I have created you from male and female. The starting point when you do male and female, then it's plural. So plural meaning to say not only that one, you go into tribes, into nations and tribes. So rejecting this from the beginning, it is rejecting the religion itself. <coughs> That's why here, we should not be going to say, oh, you know, Muslims uh, practices, they think, you know, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been for us as a model. It is a rule model for the Muslims. Whatever you do in your life, you'll say, let me see, it. is it in line with the Prophet's way of doing the things? You could see there was no more to somebody who has uh, established and reiterated and confirmed this religious freedom than the Prophet Muhammad. I have spoken in my, I said it in my presentation, this is the, during this day. If you get to this, the Charter of the Medina, what you call the Constitution of Medina, you will find it practically speaking, theoretically speaking, the religious freedom was granted to everybody. The equality in citizenship was also granted for everybody. There was no second class, as we talk it, the second class of the society, citizenship. That why here you get it, the prophet as a model, how was his relationship the Jewish community or the Christians? You will take it as a model. Himself, he got married to a Jewish lady. One of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they call her uh, Safiya, the most one they call it, the most beautiful among the wives. And she was the daughter of the, the, the chief of tribe of Banu Quraiza. And he got married with them. So today, to tell you how he has been so much What's this kind of pluralism, so this kind of pluralism, the acceptance of others. But if Muslims come today and somebody do something else and they put it in the name of Islam, we should not be going to blame Islam. But it is a criminal or sometimes somebody who might have some psychological problem, he would just like to justify it. That I would do to say that you have three items in your life that have been always hijacked by the weak people, by the criminals. These three things, first of all, the three things is religion. If you want to justify a crime, sometimes you put it in the name of religion, the religious will just forgive you. Sometimes it's not the religion, you take the race. If you want to just marginalize and say something, you put it in the name of the race, and then people will just they say, yes, it's because of this. Sometimes it could be in the name of the ethnicity. It is because of these things have been persecuted, and that's what I want to say. So therefore, I think when you go back to these seats, especially the two or the first three, you will find it what the practices which are going around today, most of these practices, does it, where, how could it be more uh, free religious, the, 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 the discord religious uh, freedom would not be the time of prophet, allowing when people, Muslim, were going for any bottle, any bottle at that time, they were, they were forbidden to destroy the churches. <coughs> They were forbidden to get touched, and anybody would get into his church. His church. They were told the message, you must not destroy. You will have to keep these things and that things. In addition to that one, we say, you need to practice the prophet, the community of Medina, when you talk about Ummah. Ummah for Muslims today, they just say Muslims. It's not only Muslims. Because Muslims and those people are living. It is the, cit the citizens, we do call them. We have taken out, because the, the Jews in Medina, they were part of the Ummah of Medina. And then the community of Medina was part of it, but we have taken it out, and then we have decided to say this is Islam, to justify some of our crimes, some of the things we do against these things. I, I would like to say here, to end up to say, I'm not just to, to justify, to say, you know, you get the, the verses in the Quran, you may like it or may not like it, you have a lot of, it is about 6,650 verses. Out of 6,650 verses, you have, they were revealed to prophets for 23 years he has to go through. 
So sometimes people just are very selective. You take one and here, and then you put it, and this is Islam. And then, but you look, the practice of prophets, his role model will be there to guide us to say, yeah, what you are saying. You talk about abrogation, or is it, because it is one of the, the way to get a way, to be away from the practice of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What, what Prophet didn't do within the 23 years of his prophecy, why you would like it to be done after him? And then you will be able to, to put it in the name of the Prophet himself. Why he did not decide and want him from the beginning to have a two citizens in the, in the Medina. He just dealt equal. He was even one of the statements in Medina stated was saying, no Jew should be projected wrongly treated because he's a Jew. Oh no, because the relationship between the Muslims and these tribes were such very, very time. They were having the same feeling, the same having, they're having the same problem. So I, I would just end up to say to that things it was something right. We, we need to continue to discuss it. It might not be easy for those people who have been going against it, but you keep talking about it as an academia, and there will be time the decision makers or whoever will be the people will get it to clear. You must dis uh, differentiate anything is violence, anything is discrimination, anything is going against these principles, do not put it in the name of Islam or do not put it in the name of even your nation to the tribe. Just put it because I might be going through some psychological problem, so I need to be treated automatically. So that's going to be help us to be that the religious freedom must be we like it. I, I did presented a paper in Abu Sharjah about religious freedom. There was a whole of people there. How could you talk about this? I say, yes. Is it forbidden to talk about it? Is it forbidden in Islam to say that you, you want to force me? And the issue of the, the, the belief, it is something has to do with the, my humanity. The, the most basic right of human being is the freedom of belief. If you, this is to define, if you want to deny him from this, that is the things you could deny him, the most things you could deny a human being from that one. So that's what Islam was saying, la ikraha, do not do and tell me it's been abrogated or it's not been abrogated, you cannot abrogate it because prophet did not do it. You couldn't do it in the name of prophet. If you do it on your own name, you could do it. So and that one, he was saying, how could you just be saying, would you allow the Muslims to do this to be equally to, he said, yes, prophet equally, he treated everybody equally. You want to do it better than prophet, or you want to do it like prophet did it? No, because these things, they have told the jizya. I told him, what do you talk about the jizya? Or we talk with dhimma. Some of the terms were created by later. At the time of prophet, there was no dhimmiyin. There was citizens of Medina. Even Omar ibn al-Khattab, for the history, I finish with that one. They created, what do you call it, jizya? It is in the Quran, but in any different context, and then, one of the Christians come to see him. I hate this term. He called me to pay jizya. Because Muslims, they have to pay zakat. And jizya is just the tax. So Omar told him, what would you like it to be called? He said, just call it sadaqah. From now onwards, nobody should call it jizya. We call it all sadaqah. Sadaqah, it is a contribution that every single citizen should do in order to defend the state in case of any attack. So he changed it. Because taking into account the feeling of others, the feeling of these things are not, it's not being stated, you must be in jizya. And then he changed it. Vimma also were created. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went in the way and to make sure that the people were there. So I think um, I, will, I would really like to be thankful to you again for such end of uh, discourse. And I'm happy that it is in such end of a great university, which is a very environment uh, friendly, and then you may have more space of here to be critic, to be creative, and to be uh, accepting <coughs> and receptive <coughs> what the things say. Thank you very much. First of all, thank all of you for your remarks. Um, th this is Probably in the history of Islam, I would argue it's probably the darkest period that the community's gone through. I think that um, it's worse than the, the Mongol period because at those times, the religion was not being blamed for anything. Uh, but I think people will look back at this period and wonder what happened. There's gonna be a lot of interest in, you know, historians look back and they try to 
to figure out what happened. Um, but the, the, the great tragedy of this time is this immense migration of these, these uh, extraordinary communities that have been in the Muslim world for centuries and actually preceded the Muslims. They were there before the Muslims. The Coptic Church in, in Egypt, the, uh, these great Christian churches in uh, Iraq, um, Lebanon, uh, they're there. Um, in, uh, in Syria. I mean, these are, these are really ancient Christian communities. There are still villages in, in, uh, in Syria that were speaking Syriac. Um, and linguists have gone to these places because they're so fascinated at a, the preservation of an ancient language like that. So um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya was so distraught about what was happening that he convened, and it actually took three years he began in Nouakchott, and uh, then we went to Tunisia, and then we went to Morocco. And it culminated with uh, what was called the Marrakesh Declaration. And just as Dr. Sano was saying, the, the, the Covenant of Medina was never abrogated. Um, it, it did collapse because of political uh, failure uh, in, in the region. Um, but the actual covenant was not abrogated. And, and, and so what Sheikh Abdullah showed was that equal citizenship was the sunnah that the Prophet laid down, that there's nothing uh, that could, could abrogate that, that the, the concept of dhimma, which is in uh, the ninth chapter of the Quran, um, was used, but it was also not used by the caliphs. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan did not use it. Um, he actually paid the Byzantines uh, for guard, guarding the, the boundaries. So he argued that it's not, it, it was an option that, that was given. And if you look at Imam al-Qarafi's um, furuq, one of the things that he says is that the purpose of the dhimma was to encourage conversion. So it was a type of soft coercion. It was the idea that, you know, hopefully that these people would want to. And that, that comes from this idea that Muslims actually believe that, that their religion is true. Christians believe their religion is true. Uh, Buddhists believe that their religion is true. The three great proselytizing faiths on the planet have been Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. And, and, and they want to share it with others. The, I just received, a, we're going to publish it in, in, a, in the journal Renovati, but I just received a paper by uh, Reuben Firestone, who's a, who's a rabbi here in, in uh, Southern California, a paper on why Jews don't proselytize. Right? And it was a very interesting paper. I mean, I've actually read about that because I was interested in it too. Um, and part of the reason was is that it's a lot harder to be a Jew than it is to be a Noahide. And so if you just teach people the seven Noahidic laws, th they're fine. There's no problem. So instead of following 613 600. laws, yeah, you just <laughs> follow seven and you're okay. So uh, it's, it's kind of a favor. That's why the rabbi has to refuse seven times um, somebody who's seeking to convert to Judaism because it's hard to be one of the chosen people. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I think that that, um, that fact that we're dealing with of this loss of these communities is a, is a great tragedy and I think it's one of the great blemishes. There have been other blemishes. Overall, the pre-modern history of Islam is certainly one of the best in the world. I think that's arguable in many uh, places, uh, what the way that they did allow for religious diversity, uh, but again, it was second-class citizenship, and uh, by modern standards, it, it wasn't. And I think Dr. Kano's point, uh, Sano's point, was very good. That, uh, or no, I think you made it that in the past, you know, they, they would be better. looking yeah. at yeah, that, that that they'd be looking at the Muslims are looking at Europe and saying, what's wrong with these. Uh, unenlightened people <laughs> that they would persecute somebody who's the same religion but a different uh, medhab Sex. or school, um, and and uh, and certainly the Ottomans did not distinguish between Protestants or Catholics or they treated them all as Nasara. So that that's interesting. But now people look at the Muslim world and say, what's wrong with these endarkened people? That, um, that would want to coerce somebody if they leave the faith. And I think um, part of it, and, and, and I think this is important to understand, is that the pre-modern world was so um, sensitive to the fact that the soul is immortal. 
And it's very difficult for modern people to understand what that actually means, that we're here for um, 60, 70, maybe 80, 90 nowadays, uh, decades, uh, eight, eight or nine decades on the planet, but we're at the doors, according to these religious traditions, of infinity. And this is why Augustine and Aquinas justified torture of the physical body, which is temporal, in order to attempt to save the eternal soul, which can never die. Um, their, their desire was, 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 the intention was a good intention. It, 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 was, it, it wasn't because they wanted to punish somebody, it was that they really genuinely wanted to save them. That type of paternalism is something so alien to the modern mind that it actually has the opposite effect, um, not just on the person being tortured, but, but on people actually seeing this happen to other people. And I, I just want to, you don't have to do this, but how many people in here actually converted from the religion of their birth? So there's quite a few converts in here. Um, in another time and in some places, that's a capital offense. Um, and, and I think the golden rule of wanting for others what you want for, for yourself is, is a very important one. It's certainly a, 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 a Muslim rule. Okay. You know, so. We've got about uh, eight minutes left. So if we have a question or two, I think we can handle it. We'll start back. We'll start here and then at the back. This right here. The gentleman in the blue. Hold on just a second. Get the mic. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa My question is, it's, a, it's part question, part uh, comment. I just wanted to bring our attention to the, um, its verses and in uh, and, um, Rome of the Romans when God talks about the uh, diversity of languages and, and, and ethnicities as one of his miracles. And then the second is um, when he talks about had not God defended one people by, by means of another, monasteries, synagogues, churches, and masjids would have been um, demolished. And I think that points to um, like a, the intention of us living together, you know, in plurality. Uh, the, the second um, question is just, I, I guess we just need to, people just need to learn and need to be, we just need to read, I guess, because that's the first uh, commandment in our, in, our, in, our, in our religion is to read, I guess. Uh, we're not, we're not conversing and we just don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Right. right behind you, I think. Yeah. Uh, along the lines of um, discussing pluralism and equal citizenship and religious freedom for uh, minority groups, uh, I was wondering what your thoughts would be on how we can deal with uh, providing those same privileges for minorities that may not be different from Muslims in a nominal sense. Nominally, they may be Muslims, but they may have a different understanding of Islam such that they've reconciled certain things that Orthodox Muslims would not be comfortable with, such as Muslims who have reconciled being Muslim while also being openly homosexual. Uh, on an individual level, we may be uh, opposed to such practices, but on a societal level, how do we deal with that in a healthy way uh, to achieve pluralism and uh, religious freedom in that sense. While the mic's coming on over here, I'll let uh, Shikanta say something on that. Uh, it, it, I, you know, I mean, obviously here we're in a secular society where people have uh, the, uh, the right to live as they feel see fit, whether they're Muslim or, or any other group. So I, I'm completely subject to the laws of this land and, and I'm not gonna impose on anybody else, uh, you know, my views about any given uh, thing as long as they don't encroach on, on me. So I think, uh, I think that's, that's my American response. Assalamu alaikum. I just had a comment about the question that, or discussion that happened about the theological framework, um, whether it's you know, conducive to uh, freedom. Um, my understanding is that we, as human beings, have major issues with um, 
coming to the truth as opposed to perception. We deal with perception um, and it's a major um, roadblock, right? So um, looking at the text of the Quran, um, scholars would differ. Um, like Sheikh Hamza, for example, have an orientation, right? Um, God's mercy, prophets, mercy, blessings, and kindness Combining that would give a different perception to the looking people at looking at textual interpretation, right? The, the exclusionism mm -hmm. um, is, is a difference. Even in um, science, people looking at the same text, same mathematical model, a mathematician would look at the model in one way a physicist should look at the model different way. They have a very different perception looking at some become reductionist and materialism versus others looking for uh, you know, spiritual aspects and combining right. like understanding consciousness, for example, um, looking for religious experience, spiritualism. So perception is the big problem. Um, in my understanding, Islam, if you actually look at the comparative religion and look at the framework, Islamic text is more rich with, uh, with uh, pluralism. Uh, the number of ayahs, like Rafiti and many, you know, um, uh, the Ta'arafu, the Sheikh Hamza alluded to. Um, in other text, is not there. Like Christianity, for example, has, um, thou shall not um, depart, like marriage, for example, has been uh, modernized to abandon that. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at the text, it would be very different um, practices. So it's, it's because of secularization of Christianity, uh, we have a different thing, um, right? Different uh, um, practices. Right. So it's, it's about perception. Yeah, so it, Sheikh Hamza talked about knowledge and getting to the reality. And my question is, I will end up with this, is that it's not, um, it's, you know, this is a right discussion to understand, but it's like, you know, Bangladesh, people, everything falls to the people, you know, the uh, um, mullahs, every <coughs> problem, whereas the whole country is being uh, run by the secular people. Mm -hmm. So the authority power of the world, um, has the responsibility to fix the world's problem instead of uh, you know, um, you know, enormous amount of money that is being spent in arms race and all the other things could be used for education of the people. <coughs> and once people are educated, this group here is on are mostly enlightened and not fighting with the street, right? People will not do that. Enlightened people don't. In the master's degree, PhD people, they don't fight with you. They, they argue, they understand. Right. So the, uh, the world population, it's not about religion. It's about power and authority and resources and educating people and right. sustaining them. Okay. The, uh, uh, sustaining you, the norm is the challenge for the right. Right. you. Right. You know, you've mentioned uh, uh, an issue that for most religious traditions that have sacred texts, uh, bedevils all of them, that what they call hermeneutics, or how do you interpret? Somebody said here talking about selecting. You, you talked to Dr. Yeah. Sano about selecting this verse and not that verse, or even what that verse means. I mean, in the Christian tradition, the sola scriptura. If anybody thought that would solve the problem, of you know, we we believe in the Bible, but people uh, think the Bible says different things. Um, and then I guess there's two questions here. Maybe we'll, it, we'll probably have to end with this, and Mustafa, and maybe you can make a final comment. The, the two questions are, how in the Islamic world, where in fact you don't have a magisterium, uh, you, have, you don't have a central sort of final word on this, that, or the other, how do you handle that? And then maybe more importantly even, you're gonna have the differences. Religious freedom, how does that affect how you deal with the differences, I guess. I, I mean, I'm certainly not a sheikh or mufti, so I'm not speaking in a jurisprudential uh, authority here, but just as a proposition, 
I think uh, regarding the question about homosexuality especially, I think all religions have the right to define certain human behavior as sin and disapprove them and to advise their followers not to commit these actions and also not to be forced to bless those actions by being forced to make a wedding cake or things like that. Mm -hmm. They might have their positions. But then individuals are free to commit those sins if they want to, and it is, it's their choice. Now, is this compatible with our traditional jurisprudential understanding? Not exactly, but we can rethink this, I think. I have a chapter in my book, which is banned in Malaysia, partly for this reason, titled The Freedom to Sin. And I there point to something that m most of us miss. In the Quran, there are certain hudud, punishments, right? These are for crimes in which there is always a victim. Theft, murder, uh, brigandage, uh, accusation, false accusation of adultery, and adultery itself, which makes a spouse being uh, hurt in, in the case. But the Quran also bans other things like alcohol or uh, gambling, or, but it doesn't bring punishments for them. The ulama with qiyas extended hudud to these, uh, and there was a discussion between Shafis and Hanafis on how well it was that. But I think we should go back today and think that not every sin is a crime, and religions can advise us uh, against yeah. sins. That's, that's always been the that's case. Been the well, not always been the case, and I think been, every... No, that's, that's always, always been, been the case. case. The the case. case. If, it is, if it is in private, it was like wine speaking. drinking Hold was on. criminal. <laughs> Dr. Mustafa, you, you, you said you weren't speaking jurisprudentially. Right. Jurisprudentially, I'm not saying jurisprudential no, no. authority. I don't claim that. Jurisprudentially, the Muslim scholars have always distinguished between two types of isma, right? Uh, there, there's an isma that is the Hanafis call it muqawwima, that they can actually rectify, and that had to do with mafsada, something that was socially corrosive, that corrupted the society, like selling drugs and doing things. No, then, drinking alcohol itself. And too. drinking alcohol, because they saw it as, a, uh, as something Mufsada. that, Mufsada, if you drank in your home, it was your own business. But if you went out in public drunkenness, which causes a lot of deaths in the United States every year, like on the road. I mean, we're looking at, yes. you know, uh, and, and if you look at violence around the world and the association of, you just Google violence and alcoholism and just look at all the social science on the amount of domestic violence that involves uh, alcohol. So they, they, they saw alcohol as a mafsada. And, 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 and so, but they distinguished between that and a masiya, which is something like backbiting. You cannot socially regulate uh, the personal sins of people. A, a state doesn't have that capacity to do that. But sins that will impinge on the rights of other peoples they saw as something that needed to be so exactly but right? what uh, criminalized the drinking alcohol publicly was not the quran but the quran has no punishment hudud on drinking alcohol in public i mean it's of course hadith and other post quranic sources <laughs> quran didn't tell you how to pray either but anyway <clears throat> i i i i do want to uh, agree with one part of what you said i mean the first part of what you said and i think that again in, in the theme on the theme of religious freedom um, religious communities will be at various stage in their debate over various and sundry issues. And I think that part of religious freedom, communally speaking, is to allow those communities to undergo those debates among themselves on the basis of the sources and authorities that are native to those religions. And not to come from outside, because we live in a modern, liberal, whatever world, and say, no, you must adopt this right now, even if it's completely incommensurable with the sources, authorities, and tradition of interpretation within your religion. And, you know, all of us, I mean, Sheikh Hamza, you know, talked about living in families. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not always, right. you know. And, and also, if a religion adopts the zeitgeist, when the zeitgeist's over, it doesn't have any followers. <laughs> zeitgeist doesn't last very long. Okay. With that, I think it's a good I, note to end on. <laughs> Um, let me I, just, uh, I, I, let me just, you want to say, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, one of the issues which is very important for Muslims or for the humanity at large, that is the level of the knowledge of individuals. Uh, Islamically speaking or intellectually speaking, we are not allowed to give fatwa or to give this sum of verdict if you are not qualified for it. Yeah. 
because it is equal to medicine. Is every human being uh, allowed to give? If I go to see, a, a meet my friend Farouk, I tell him, you know, I got headache here, and I would say, just go and take this and that one. My, my take this one going to be, for me, something which is going to kill me. The same thing for religious items. When you come, why we are having extremism, when we are having the extremists, we have terrorism, all, because you just take it, something like that. Somebody come to say this, and then he or she will take it, and you go and blow up everywhere together. But he will have it. In America, you have the learned people like Sheikh Hamza, Sheikh, maybe you have got over here. The young people they need to refer to. It's true, we are not going to tell the people everybody is free. No, but you have to go. If I go to the co college, the, co the faculty over here, I will not be going to exercise to be a lawyer in this society without going through the process. The process, I have to be here, and I have to study for how many years, and I have to pass all my courses, and I got the license from them. You're not asking the people to get the license to allow every human being to say. That is this kind of disorder, this kind of uh, indiscipline, you may call it, had created such everybody is taking himself. As one have spoken about the reading, it's not, we just have, you read before you pray. And the reading, Prophet spent the 10 years almost in Medina, in Mecca. There was no prayer. When you get these things before, prayer was not obligatory for upon Muslims. When he moved to Medina, the prayer people started praying over there. Why he did spend all these 10 years? Because he wanted people to get educated. I do believe all the things will go through if we have people who are highly, who are qualified, educated, and they do understand the things then. Because if you don't know, uh, we are enemy for something that we ignore. If you ignore the things, sometimes you become enemy, you become offensive for it. Because if you get to know it clearly, mm -hmm. you will not. So I would believe here in America, you get, get to, to these learned people. They will be for you a guide. Not because they want to impose, but they will tell you sometimes. You get something mixed in my mind. I don't get it clear. This is the problem here. Because they have been spending all their life, <laughs> Sheikh Hamza, been spending all their life, the day of nights. Don't do anything. Don't have some time family life. Because they won't really have such an of this qualification. I would just yeah. be for that one and thank you in, very much. In a university setting, to end with an affirmation of education is okay. <laughs> and uh, so I appreciate that. I want to uh, just say two things, things very, very quickly. Thanks to Pepperdine for uh, hosting us here. Thanks to you. Malibu is a beautiful place, but you have to drive a, an hour or two or three, some of you, and you've come. So thank you very much. And family. Thanks to our panel for their great job and Sheikh Hamza. <laughs> One final point, uh, the participants in the consultation, there's a special dinner set, uh, or lunch set aside for you in the cafeteria to the right in the